a half-wolf warrior, a talking troll, and a sorcerer egomaniac. There couldn't be a more diverse group of allied individuals. We'll be delving into who these characters really are and why Rani chose them specifically to help her. Let's explore Blythe, E.G. and Celebus. The title of Bodyguard for Blythe is an understatement. Blythe is a beast man whose sole purpose is to protect his chosen Imperian, being Rani. Name's Blythe. Sworn sword to Mistress Rani. Another example of this is Merica and her beast man, Malekith. Each of us was chosen by our own two fingers, as a candidate to succeed Queen Merica, to become the new god of the coming age, which is when I received Blythe in the form of a vassal tailored for an Imperium. As a quick recap, Rani had the potential to become Marika's successor, but she didn't want someone else to decide her fate, so she decided not to live anymore, or rather not live in her demigod body under the control of the Greater Will. Once she did this, her soul was transferred into a doll, and with your assistance, you will help Rani take the remaining steps to become completely free and forge a new future. Now the biggest issue with Rani's goal is that this creates a paradox for Blythe. He was created by the Greater Will to help Rani further the Greater Will's agenda, but they didn't expect for Rani to rebel. So the purpose Blythe was created for and what he was created to protect directly contradict each other and Blythe's story is his struggle with choosing a side. And what makes this worse is that Blythe considers Rani like a sister to him. E.G. tells us that they both grew up together. Blythe is Lady Rani's stepbrother. Rani's mother, Queen Renala, approved of him, and they played like siblings from childhood. They were always happy to have me tag along as well. Now you know how deep this bond is that they share, let's talk about E.G. and get introduced to him. The first most notable thing we discover about E.G. is that he is a troll who can talk, something that we haven't experienced with any of the other trolls. But that's not to say that other trolls are unintelligent. Take for example the Troll Knights. They were called into service when the Queen invoked an oath they swore. The trolls are treated as true knights of Caria and fight arm in arm with their human comrades. This big tablet that you see in their chest cavity could be that oath in question, which keeps them loyal. But without this influence, they seem to be smart enough to comprehend military strategy, master sorcery, and in Eiji's case, able to provide war stratagems to the Karian princess. Interestingly, Eiji in Japanese can be written with the kanji for stone and ground, which is fitting for both his blacksmith profession and his body. And the second most notable thing about Eiji is what he is wearing on his head, a cage of mirrors. At first I thought this helm was some kind of punishment, forced to stare at one's reflection inches away at every angle. But its description tells another story. Instead of reflecting what's on the inside, it deflects the outside. Worn by those committed to high treason, it wards off the intervention of the greater will and its vassal fingers. In other words, it's a tinfoil hat, but it supposedly does work. E.G. is able to assist Rani whilst they take action to defy the greater will. The greater will being a godlike entity that communicates through the two fingers. And the treachery mentioned here is that E.G. is an accomplice to Rani, and as war counsellor, E.G.'s thoughts would reveal their plans, which is why he wears this mirror helm in an attempt to guard his mind. And last, but most definitely least, we have Celebus. As far as first impressions go, He's conceited. If it were up to me, I wouldn't waste my time on the likes of you. It's insulting. I don't know what it is the mistress sees in a provincial tarnished like you. Patronizing. I ask that you kindly try not to drag us all down with you. He's a dick. He's just a dick. 
for no reason. Celebus is a sorcery preceptor, a teacher of glintstone magic who served under the Carian royals. But his quest isn't so much to do with sorcery as it is to do with another hobby. When you speak to Celebus in his tower, he immediately tasks you with doing his dirty work. I'd like you to find a woman called Nefeli to administer a potion. Even you can do that much, can't you? He doesn't tell us what this potion is, nor does the item description. Now I have faith that you wouldn't just give someone a mystery liquid to drink after being ordered to by an unreputable source, right? If you show the potion to Gideon, he knows exactly what it is. Is that potion what I think it is? Bloody Salivus. I suppose he's up to something again. Are you really going to do the bidding of that twisted Dolly Botherer? Dolly Botherer. Celevis's twisted hobby is turning people into dolls, puppets specifically. That potion would have made Nephili fall into a deep sleep, and then Celevis would have had his way with her. We discover this in a secret underground room hidden near Celevis's tower. A variety of people, different backgrounds, different roles, all slumped and lifeless. And in the back room, a bed. And this is where you can find Nephili if you did indeed give her the potion. And this is just the beginning of Celevis's degeneracy. The reason he was targeting Nephili specifically is because Celevis appears to have some sort of control and superiority complex. Earlier when we spoke to Gideon, he was already familiar with Celevis and his work because Celevis targeted someone close to Gideon called Dolores. Dolores once belonged to the Round Table Hold, where she was both a critic and a friend of Gideon the All-Knowing. It was because of her that he and Celevis went their separate ways. Now you can interpret this as a love triangle situation. Celevis loved Dolores, but she loved Gideon. Or perhaps it wasn't as strong as love, but Celevis was jealous of the attention that Gideon received. After all, Dolores is described as being very good looking. So Celevis turned her into a puppet so that he could quite literally manipulate her as he wished, making her look at him and no one else. This understandably would create a rift between Celevis and Gideon. But Celevis would then go on to target Nefeli, who is Gideon's adopted daughter. It seems like too much of a coincidence that two of the victims happen to be associated closely with Gideon, hinting that Celevis did this because of a personal vendetta, and perhaps overcompensating for feelings of inadequacy. His goal to become a master of puppets would give him back the control that he so desperately struggled for which is most likely why he is so demeaning to us. He wants to feel superior. Now at this point you might be asking, why on earth would Rani want someone like this in her close circle? It's not like Celevis's hobby was a secret. Gideon, Selen and Blythe are just some of the NPCs who vocalise their dislike for Celevis. So why does Rani let him serve her? Well, when Rani planned her death, her soul was transferred into a doll body. And who do you think got her that doll body? The puppet body. It's likely that Celevis was the one. He had access to the tools necessary and a hidden cellar to hide the body in until it was needed. Celevis is a very cunning man, but so is Rani. More on that later, but for now, let's talk about the next events of Rani's quest. You are tasked with retrieving the hidden treasure of Nokron for Rani. You team up with Blythe to help take down Radan, who will drop a falling star and open up our path to Nokron. And within Nokron is a particular weapon that has the power to destroy Rani's last remaining tie to her fate, the Finger Slayer Blade. Like the name suggests, this blade can destroy Rani's own two fingers that she referenced earlier. When we give this to Rani, this will trigger many new events with our three fellows in question. Firstly, Blythe will completely disappear off the map. He's no longer at his typical hangout spot at Nokron, nor Rani's Rise. Rani, Salavus and E.G. don't give us any leads. So where has Blythe gone? Or should I say, 
where has Blythe been taken to? If you happen to meet Blythe before he appears at Rani's Rise, he actually has a small quest of his own. He needs your help to dispatch a traitor called Darrowell, who is locked in an Everjail. Regardless if you've defeated Darrowell and cleared the Everjail beforehand, this is actually where we find Blythe now. It's me, Blythe. Old E.G. trapped me here. Told me I'd bring North but failed to Lady Rani. But there's no chance that could happen. I'm part of a being. A very shadow. In an unexpected twist, E.G. was the one who took Blythe to this Everjail because he foresaw that Blythe would bring naught but Bale. Bale in this context meaning a greater evil, woe or sorrow. Confronting E.G. with this information, he reveals to us that this was all a preventative measure for what is to come. The two fingers gave Blythe to Lady Rani as a faithful follower, her very shadow, incapable of treachery. But if Lady Rani, as an Empyrean, resists being an instrument of the Two Fingers, the shadow will go mad, transforming from a follower into a horrid curse. Like we mentioned earlier, if Rani continues on her path to defy the Two Fingers, then Blythe is doomed. As it's Rani's destiny to destroy her two fingers, it's also Blythe's destiny to succumb to the greater will. Their eternal hold over him will drive him insane if he does not obey. As a seasoned war counsellor, E.G. is incredibly disciplined, strategic and level-headed. He clearly has thought this decision through, but not to say it wasn't an incredibly difficult one. It pains me so but he must be neutralised for Lady Rani's sake. These three have such a tight bond together, but ultimately E.G. has to choose to protect the life of the one he swore allegiance to. And the word neutralise here is of specific importance. The definition can either mean to make ineffective or to kill and destroy. But where is Rani in all of this? Is she aware of E.G.'s decision? Rani is currently seeking refuge in another body, a smaller miniature doll body. I turned my back on the two fingers, and we have each been cursing the other since. The baleful shadows are their assassins. The Greater Will has caught wind of her plan to go after her personal two fingers, so as a result, they have sent assassins to hunt her down which is why you are now protecting the smaller, more portable Rani. And a particular baleful shadow that we run into is not only familiar in name, we mentioned the word bale earlier, but it is also familiar in appearance. A red shadowy wolf appears, wearing the guise of our friend Blythe. He looks, moves and howls just like the wolfman we are accustomed to. But it isn't him, it's just a cruel trick of the two fingers, disguising their assassin to appear as someone close to both us and Rani. Rani seems to have already recognised this as a ploy, warning us beforehand. And this probably isn't the first time that the two fingers have planned a trick like this. You can find a mask mimicking Blythe's appearance behind Celevis's rise. Relic of an assassin who assumed the guise of Rani the Witch's loyal shadow, the likeness is striking. This assassin has already been dispatched, but their ability to create an almost perfect disguise has very sinister undertones. It's almost like a sick joke to try and imitate one of Rani's closest figures, just for some twisted satisfaction, knowing that if she did perish by their hand, the last thing she would see was that familiar face ending her life. But thankfully, the baleful shadow that we face here is just an imposter. And after we take it down, Rani may continue unpursued. Now I can finally stand before them. This is farewell, my dear. Tell Blythe and E.G. I love them. And at this point, she will go and fight her two fingers. A battle that sounds like she's unsure if she will return from. It's interesting that she doesn't group Celebus in this heartfelt goodbye. It's almost like she doesn't like him 
This is probably true. Salivus is always the odd one out. Salivus has been planning something for a while now. If you manage to get on his more favourable side, convince him that you are just like him, passionate about puppets, he will reveal that he is attempting to create the best puppet yet. A ploy to fool even Lady Rani? How does that sound? Salivus wants to gain control of a demigod. Specifically, he wants to turn Rani into his puppet. Whether this is because of him tiring of being subservient to her, or because targeting a demigod is the next logical step for him to feed his ever-hungering ego, it's his latest fixation to manipulate his mistress. In order to do so, you can't make any normal potion like the one you gave to Nefeli. This potion requires the ingredient, Amber Starlight. Then I'd like you to procure something. A rather unique starlight shard that glistens with amber. With that, my special draft will gleam with nectar sweetness. And even a demigod would be slave to its charms. Now I already know what you're thinking. How will this potion work if Rani is already technically a doll? And it won't. This is a massive oversight by Celevis, perhaps too fixated on his mission to overpower everything he comes into contact with. Either way, Rani doesn't tolerate any of this. This is a most unpleasant awakening. The depths of wickedness never fail to surprise me. I am saddened that thou wouldst succumb to such depravity, led astray by Celevis with devious tonic in hand. Didst thou think to have thy way with me? Be gone. Now based on this dialogue, it doesn't appear that Rani has taken a sip of the potion. She is a doll after all, she doesn't have the anatomy to be able to swallow it. So as to how effective this potion is, we don't know, as she won't let us get that far. Rani is an incredibly guarded character. She isn't very trusting of anyone. And why should she be? She has Celevis in her midst. Returning to our current timeline, regardless if you help Celevis or not, when you return to Rani's rise, you will find him dead in his tower. It could be that Rani discovered Celevis's deceitfulness and took him out before he could do the same to her. Or maybe something else. There are more parties at play than meets the eye here. Let's check in on our two other vassals. The last we heard from Blythe is that he was in the Ever Jail. I'm going to see Mistress Rani now. I don't know what came over old E.G. But even if the odds are slim, I need to check that Mistress is safe. You will get this dialogue when you free Blythe, but regardless if you chose to free him or not, Blythe will always find a way out. His desire to seek out his mistress is too strong, but there is also another strong desire that compels him. No, I'm part of her very being. I can never betray her. No matter what might happen, Rani, she needs me. This is what E.G. was afraid of, the inevitable turning point for Blythe where the two fingers programming would overtake his consciousness, and we are the first thing that he sees when he does, lashing out at us as we are a traitor by association, Rani's accomplice, Rani's champion. Blythe cannot be reasoned with, he has passed the point of no return. All there is left to do now, as he once said, fight, sword and fang. He dies without saying another word, mind completely taken over by the two fingers. The moment where his mind would win over his heart. And Iji knew that Rani would be in danger when he did, and we do find Blythe at Rani's rise, her usual dwelling place. Iji was right all along. He tried to save Blythe by sentencing him to eternity in the Ever Jail. Ironically, that Ever Jail was used to keep the traitor Darrowell locked up, and arguably, Blythe is here for the same reason. He is doomed to betray Rani by turning on her. The name of this Ever Jail is the Forlorn Hound Ever Jail. In other words, the prison of the pitiful, hopeless dog. A phrase which can both apply to Darrowill and Blythe. And if this wasn't heartbreaking enough for you, what happens if you tell E.G. of Blythe's death? 
unthinkable. How could Blythe? How did he break free from his cell? No. More importantly, Blythe became a curse that plagued Lady Rani. Yet even in madness, gave himself to her. I've made a grave misjudgment. And I thought myself a capable war counsellor. It's important to note that the outcome of Blythe escaping will happen either way. It's not explained how he manages to do this. Perhaps the Two Fingers' power over him gave him newfound strength. But as E.G. says, that's not the point. What's done has been done. I'll catch up with you soon enough, Blythe. When I do, I only hope you'll accept my apology. I'll catch up with you soon enough in this context can only mean one thing. E.G. also dies. The circumstances of his death are quite strange though. Immediately you notice that his body is engulfed in flames, what looks like black flame to be exact. And also, there are three corpses around E.G.'s body which have mysteriously now appeared. You may recognise this armour as belonging to the Black Knife Assassins. And not only do you find these bodies with E.G., but you also find them beside Blythe. As a quick reminder, the Black Knife Assassins were the ones who were contracted to end Godwin's life, and they were hired by Rani. Godwin's death helped her die by killing off her Empyrean body and allowing her soul to be free. With this knowledge and the way these scenes are set, was it Rani who ordered the Assassins to take out her vassals? If we entertain this theory for a moment, as painful as it is, Let's consider the nature of these three deaths. Salavis perished with no assassins as collateral. It seems like it wasn't much of a struggle. Perhaps because Salavis was proficient in sorcery, but maybe not in combat. Based on his last words, E.G. accepted death because of his guilt, so this would also be an easy kill. Blythe was the only one who survived the assassination attempt, as he is still alive when we find him. Presumably, the assassins didn't expect him to be as powerful in this enraged state. But what about the one important reason, the motive? Why would Rani want to kill off her beloved members? Salavas being the exception to this, it's likely that Rani knew about his disloyalty. Well, she may have done this because Rani is selfish. Her story started with defying a family tradition simply because she wanted to do what she wanted. And then she collected together a group of people who she knew could benefit her and further her scheme until she was able to achieve it. And when that happened, she would have no more use for them. Each member of the group has a certain set of skills that can benefit her, but only take them so far. E.G. as a war counsellor likely helped Rani devise the assassination plot and the finger slayer scheme. Blythe ensured personal protection of Rani at all times, and Celevis helped create both Rani's dull body and probably the little miniature Rani as well for her to hide in. This makes Rani's words from earlier hit differently. Feel secure in gaining from them. What advantage thou canst. If we are pursuing this theory, it's important to distinguish that as selfish as Rani is, she is not entirely heartless. Her last words regarding Blythe and E.G. are a confession of her love. It's not a decision that she takes lightly. In fact, these two might have known that this moment was coming. As deep and unsettling as this theory is, it doesn't explain a key detail. Why is E.G.'s body only burning with the black flame? Unlike their name would suggest, black knife assassins don't actually use black flame in their attacks. Their blades are imbued with the rune of death, which gave them the power to kill demigods like Godwin. And the rune of death is characterised by a red flame. I tested out getting hit by these black knife assassins, enduring both their normal and special attacks, just to observe the particle effect. I took some fatal hits as well, to emulate what E.G. would have taken, 
just to see if there was any difference, but no, most definitely it's a red flame. And you know where we've also seen this red flame? When we fought the Blythe lookalike, their weapon was imbued with the Rune of Death. It not only looked the same, but had the same status effect, reducing your maximum HP. But what exactly is my point here? Well, this would contradict the theory that Rani hired the Black Knife assassins to kill her vassals, because they were trying to kill her first with the Baleful Shadow. And Rani describes these assassins as belonging to the Two Fingers. So to bring it all back, instead of Rani hiring the Black Knife assassins, it was the Two Fingers regaining control of them and sending them after her vassals as revenge. And this would have been impossible to do earlier because E.G. was wearing the mirror helm that reflected the Two Fingers intervening. But when we find him dead, resting on his anvil is the mirror helm. This would suggest that when E.G. discovered Blythe's death, he was racked with guilt and removed the one thing shrouding his location, and this is what prompted the Black Knives after him. But what about the Black Flame? Chalice, we already discussed that Black Knives don't use Black Flame, but who else uses Black Flame? The Godskins. The Godskin Apostles' incantations have particle effects that appear to match what can be found on Eiji's body. But it seems strange that a new party would intervene at this late stage of the questline. Not to mention, it doesn't explain why Celephus's dead body doesn't have the black flame on it. If we pursue this theory, then there is a connection between the godskins and Rani. When you go to find Rani's original Empyrean body in the Divine Tower, there is actually a godskin guarding the way. Very interesting and not a coincidence. And also, the gloom-eyed queen led the apostles. It is said that she was an Empyrean chosen by the fingers. So the godskins serve the gloom-eyed queen, who is then under the two fingers. It's a tenuous link, but it may explain why the fingers ordered the godskins to intervene, because the black knife assassins couldn't kill him. But that wouldn't explain why the assassins died. That could only be possible if E.G. put up a fight, which would contradict his last words, seeming to long for his own death. Or it could be that the Black Knife assassins weren't trying to take out the vassals at all. They were there to protect them. Rani hired them because she knew that the Two Fingers were targeting her friends. The group that went to protect Blythe failed because he was going through his transformation. And as a result, he lashed out at them unintentionally and the ones that went to E.G. were caught up in some kind of explosion. A lot is unknown about E.G.'s origin and his potential. It could be that the assassins try to stop him from ending his life, and E.G. is the one who used some sort of black flame magic to do the deed. Or lastly, it could be a mistake. It's my very last resort to say that FromSoft put the wrong texture on E.G. and meant to put the red flame instead. But then that still wouldn't explain why Celevus doesn't have a flame texture on him at all. Unless he didn't die to an assassin or a godskin. An interesting theory is that Celevus, in fact, is a puppet himself. And this theory is based on the existence of another character called Pidia. Close to Celevis's rise, there is an Albanuric servant who serves the Carrion family. Pidia has puppets of his own, claiming to be tasked with maintaining them. After you give Rani the Finger Slayer blade, when you visit Pidia, you will hear him crying out. Why, how, how could you forget such a Please, I beg you, cease this cruelty. He has been slain by his own puppets. This event triggers at the same time when we find out that Selvus is also dead. The position in which he dies seems awfully familiar. Slumped shoulders, head back, just like all of those other inactive puppets. One perspective you can take is that Pidia was the one controlling Selvus all this time. When you first meet Pidia, he seems startled as to who we are. The way he acknowledges us seems like he already knows. You? I, uh, sorry, your worship. Which is strange because we've never met him. 
Pidia also sells the map which indicates where you can find the Amber Starlight, the main ingredient which Celephus needs to create the Amber Draft. And when you find Pidia dead, depending on your earlier choices, he will either drop the Nefeli puppet or the Dolores puppet. So Pidia is definitely linked to Celevus in some way. So what else indicates that Celevus is a puppet? Well, one reason has to do with semantics. In the puppet cellar, there is a message which says, Celevus's puppet do not touch. There are two ways in which you can interpret this sentence, that this is a puppet that belongs to Celevus, or this is a puppet of Celevus. In other words, instead of Celevus proclaiming ownership of a puppet, this is an indication of which puppet is Celevus. The word puppet singular is used, not puppets plural, because it is referring to a specific one. The puppet is Celevus. And presumably this message was placed next to his puppet, but because we cannot see one here, it clearly means that one is in use. Also something I notice is that Celevus has a unique ball bearing, the item you receive from deceased NPCs. The sorcerer archetype has a particular style of ball bearing, blue and infused with glint stones. But Celevus's ball bearing is completely unique. It's identical to the sorcerer one, but its colour palette is more dull, like the light of the glintstones has faded, akin to a once living body that is now a husk turned puppet. The flavour of this theory is excellent. The irony that Celevus, the puppet fanatic, happened to be a puppet himself all along. However, there are a few unexplained components. The sequence of events doesn't really add up. If you have happened to visit Celevus before you witness Pidia dying, Celevus's body will be inactive first. Then when you go to visit Pidia, he will still be alive because his dialogue lines trigger. This casts doubt on whether Celevus really did die as a consequence of his puppet master dying beforehand. Secondly, Celevus's position. I've seen this being discussed as the main point of evidence for Celevus being a puppet. However, this pose isn't exclusively used for puppets. It's used for other NPCs who have died in a sitting position, like E.G. for example, he's in the same pose. Thirdly, puppets cannot talk. An example of such is Finger Made in Therolina, a puppet that we can buy from Celevis's shop. But she's also a summon at the Radan fight. She doesn't utter any words to us, presumably because her physical movements are being controlled, but her voice cannot be. So by that logic, it wouldn't make sense that Celevis is able to speak of his own accord. If Pidia is able to control Celevis, why couldn't he control those three puppets that came alive to enact revenge on him? Perhaps it was Rani. Upon learning the truth, she decided there'd be a no more fitting end than a slow and painful ironic death. I think it would be hard to pull off a scheme like this under Rani's nose. She picked up pretty quickly that Celevis was plotting to turn her into a puppet, so I highly doubt that she wouldn't have noticed that Pidia was the one controlling Celevis. It does help that Celevis is covered head to toe, face especially, which would hide any trace of his deceased body showing. The puppet bodies have a quite distinct expression on their face. But there is one thing left to discuss. Why is Pidia doing this? Well, that goes back to his origin as an Albanuric. Although he is called a servant, I think slave is a more appropriate term. You see, first generation Albanurics cannot walk, that's a result of the failed experimentation by the Carrion family. So Pidia is trapped, unable to leave, hatred in his heart for the Carrion family. So he tried to get us to do his bidding by targeting Rani with a potion, as she is the most tangible of the Carrion family, turning her into a puppet as revenge. I think there is a strong argument for both theories, although I think it's likely that Celevis and Pidia just happen to have had a mutual and depraved hobby, and they both got what they deserved. However, I can't say the same for Blythe and E.G. As a side note, you can save E.G. and Blythe from death. In order to get Rani's ending, it's not a mandatory requirement to return to them after giving Rani the Fingerslayer Blade. 
By not encountering Blythe before he completely turns, there will be no need to kill him. You then don't need to tell E.G. of Blythe's demise, and by that logic, E.G. will not have that primary reason to end his life. It's one of those quests by not interacting at some point, technically you can save these NPCs. Although it's likely that Blythe was already done for, his transformation was imminent. But in this case, it's reassuring to know that he will not be the one to die by your hand. Thank you everybody so much for watching and your patience. There are many theories that I've discussed today, so please I encourage you to leave a comment with which theory you personally subscribe to or any other different ones that I might not have mentioned. I've really enjoyed focusing on the character's psychological um, state, kind of like my Bok video. That's just what I love to do. I love to understand how characters think and feel, what what motivates them to do what they do. So please let me know if you enjoyed this style of video. And yes, just thank you so, so much for watching. Thank you all. A special thank you to all of my channel members. Reasons 5, Jewel Bite, Kyle Coldwell, Grim, Hellborn Hero, Retoya Blom, Exile Turtle, Bloodfallen223, Jeremy, Moncaro, Kichu, Sam Fanny, Joe Africano, Nubist, Chase, Just Nick, Kevin H, Tagonon Dow, Tabris, Jonathan Viras, Frankie Felix, Tarnished Ozzy, Milo Raglan, Cheatma, Daunted232, Jeremy Horatius, Dark Souls Weeb, Grizzlify, Echo Sandwich, Kim Westman, Bucky, Liver22, Drip Kennedy, STK True, Punish Nickname, and Mesgear. Thank you everyone so much.